James chapter 2. We've been, over the last few months, we've been working our way through the Bible and looking at what the Bible has to teach us about worship. And uh, we've seen that the Bible has a lot to say about worship. And it's been, a, for me, I, it's been a rich series. I hope it's been uh, beneficial to you as well. I was looking, when did we actually start working on this as we're now getting to the end? And we started this series all the way back in August of last year. And uh, that was shocking to me, but nevertheless, that's the reality. Time does seem uh, to fly. And so what we've found as we've studied this subject of worship is that it's incredibly broad. It's not only dealing with music and song, but it has to do with the content of our hearts and even beyond our hearts, the way we live our lives and our thoughts and our actions and not only when we gather, especially when we gather, but not only, but also when we are not gathered together, that worship really touches and encompasses every area of our lives. And so tonight, as we're getting towards the end of the study, we find ourselves in the book of James, seeing what it is that James might teach us about worship. The book of James is interesting, uh, written by an interesting character in the New Testament. James is the natural half-brother of the Lord Jesus. So he's uh, offspring of Mary and Joseph by natural birth, and we say that he's the half-brother of Jesus because uh, Jesus had no earthly father, but they shared Mary in common. Jesus, of course, was conceived uh, by a miracle of the Holy Spirit. And James wasn't not, he was not originally part of Jesus' disciples. He, uh, during Jesus' earthly ministry, he did not follow Jesus or walk with Jesus or, from what we can see in the gospel accounts, believe in Jesus. In fact, Jesus' own family really struggled with uh, who Jesus said he was and the things Jesus said he came to do and the things that he was doing. And we see at least on one account that Jesus' own mother and his brothers came to basically take Jesus back home because he was, in their eyes, getting a little bit too big for his britches. And we can assume, and I think rightfully assume, though James is not named among those that were part of that group, I think we can deduct that, that he was part of that group that went to try and bring Jesus back home. But something changed in James' life when he saw Jesus, not just as his half-brother who had gotten too big for his britches, but when he saw him crucified and three days later risen. So something changed in, in his perspective on who Jesus was. So that as when, he, when Christ appeared to him, risen from the dead, he, went, he became a, a believer, a true believer in Jesus and uh, became a great leader within the New Testament church, the early church, eventually taking on the senior leadership role of the mother church in Jerusalem in the first century. And the book of James is an incredibly practical book. There's not a whole lot of doctrine like Paul's letters. In fact, there's hardly any doctrine in there at all. But James focuses on how we live out our faith. That's his focus. That faith without works is dead. If we claim to have faith, it, it should manifest in our lives at some level, at some shape. If we just say we believe in God, we say we believe in Christ... But there's no evidence in our life, James says, that that faith is dead. And we don't want to be like that. He says also in this letter that if we only hear the word, but we don't do the word, we ourselves are deceived. And so James's emphasis is very much on practical Christianity, real Christianity, not just a bunch of theological ideas up here in the sky somewhere, but what does it look like to live those out in our lives? And so in that vein, what, what James ends up contributing uh, to the topic of worship, of course, ends up being extremely practical. 
And it has to do with our gathering. When we gather together, our behavior with one another in our gatherings. And so James chapter 2, with that introduction, James chapter 2, we're going to look at tonight verses 1 through 9. James chapter 2, verses 1 through 9. My brothers, show no partiality as you hold the faith in our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory. For if a man wearing a gold ring and fine clothing comes into your assembly, and a poor man in shabby clothing also comes in, and you pay attention to the one who wears the fine clothing and Say to him, here you sit over here in this good place. While you say to the poor man, you stand over there or sit down here at my feet. And, and that, that place of sitting at someone's feet would be where the, the children would sit or the, the servants would sit. A place of dishonor. He says, have you not made distinctions among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? Listen, my beloved brothers, has not God chosen those who are poor in the world to be rich in the faith and heirs of the kingdom, which he has promised to those who love him? But you have dishonored the poor man. And are not the rich the ones who oppress you? He's talking here about the cultural elites, the, the, those who were very powerful, those who, who had a lot of wealth, especially in his day. He's saying, aren't those the ones who oppress you? And the ones who drag you into court? Are they not the ones who blaspheme the honorable name by which you were called? If you really fulfill the royal law according to the scripture, you shall love your neighbor as yourself, You are doing well. But if you show partiality, you are committing sin and are are convicted by the law as transgressors. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word tonight. Lord, over the next few moments, I pray that you would help us. Lord, not to just be hearers, but Lord, that, that you would eradicate from our fellowship, eradicate from our church, the sin of partiality. Lord, that we would do as we are instructed in your word all throughout your law to love our neighbors as ourselves. Lord, show us even tonight through the work of your Holy Spirit, reveal to us areas of prejudice. Reveal to us blind spots that we may not even see, but that you see and that are sinful in your eyes, Lord, that we might turn from them, repent of them, and receive healing tonight. Lord, that Destiny Church would be a church for all people of of all stages, of all economic situations, of all races and colors and, and cultures. Lord, that our church would be a picture of heaven. That's our desire. Lord, that's your desire as well. So help us, Lord to be that kind of people. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. James starts here, chapter 2, verse 1. He says, brothers, show no partiality. Tonight I want to give an explanation of what partiality is and then three uh, points for us to take home tonight. So partiality, what is it? What, What does this mean to show partiality? Again, he's giving us instruction, practical instruction for when we come together. We've gathered here tonight. That means that if we come together, if we gather just as they were doing there, that the temptation can be there, the, the, the uh, temptation to show partiality. So this is something that we need to be aware of, something we need to be looking for, something we need to allow the Lord to sanctify in our lives. And as Christians gather for worship, he calls out this particular sin, the sin of showing partiality. So what is it, this sin? It's showing favoritism, showing favoritism to, to one group or another based on their status in society. 
That's what he's addressing here. Based on their, their, their status in their society, that, that all of a sudden, because they have something out there, they're recognized for something in the world, that then when they come into the church, they're recognized in the same way. And what James is saying is that we should not show favoritism. We should not show uh, 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 this kind of favoritism based on someone's status in the culture or their status in the society or the world. Now, this is the natural way of living. Is that not right? Is this not the way the world works? Is this not the way that society works and structures itself? That, that the wealthy and, and the powerful and, and the famous and the celebrity and, and the elites and the educated and, and all the other things and all the other titles, all the other, you know, the, the superstars, the athletes, the movie stars, aren't those the people put on pedestals out in the world? James says that when we come into the church, we should not divide ourselves like that. That there shouldn't be these, these classes of Christians within the church based on the values of the world. That's the natural way of living. And James is saying, don't live in the natural. Don't follow your flesh, your natural inclinations. I know that he's... He's not using theological terms. I know he's not talking in this language, but, but the, the, the way that Paul would express this would be, don't live in the flesh, but live in the spirit. Walk in the spirit. Don't walk in the flesh. The way this was playing out in their church, which most likely was a house church, most likely was a very small space, most likely... Uh, didn't have a whole lot of room for people. And so when, when somebody would come in, if they were meeting, if they were gathering in a house, and of course they weren't, you know, they weren't living in these mansions like we live in. Very small homes, very humble places. You think of what it would take to fill a one-room house or a two-room house, not a whole lot of people. And so here now in the gathering, here now in the church, walks in somebody who's well-dressed, walks in somebody who's put together, walks in somebody of, of status in the, in the culture. And then you push somebody out and you take their seat and their spot and you push them to the back and you say, you go stand in the back where it's standing room only or, or you stand outside and listen through the window and we're going to make space for this person because of the way they're dressed and because they're a person of means. Giving positions of honor to those who are something by worldly standards. And because this is the natural way that the world works... If we're not careful, we can do the same thing. We can be totally blind to this reality. Because this, this is just life. And so James is saying you have to work at not being this way because this is the natural order of things. Now, of course, when we gather for worship 2,000 years later, Things play out a little differently in our culture. Nobody wants to sit on the front rows. We don't have this issue here. In fact, it is the back row that is the most populated. God bless you. I can see you back there because the lights are so bright up here. But I, I, all the back row people, I, I know well because I can see you back there. But just because the circumstances are different, the reality is that our hearts are not. So we're not gathered in a little house. We're not gathered where we're pressed for space. That does not mean that the sin of partiality isn't a temptation for us. What it does mean is that it will just manifest in different ways. It will manifest in and play out 
in different ways in our gatherings of, for worship. And so we must still fight and put this sin to death. So that's a, a brief explanation of it. Now three points for us tonight. Let's look again at verse 1. He says, My brothers, show no partiality as you hold the faith in our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory. Po point number one is that showing partiality and the gospel of Jesus do not mix. Th these things do not mix. If we're going to hold on to the gospel, if we're going to hold on to the faith of the Lord Jesus Christ... We cannot hold on to partiality. We cannot hold on to our prejudices that the world wants to put in us. We live in a world today that is wanting to divide people upon any micro line that it can find, any little crack that it can to divide people. The, the world and the culture is trying to divide us up into those groups, identity groups. To, to split us off into isolated little pieces. But the gospel of Jesus Christ, it tears down all of those walls. Ephesians chapter 3, Paul talks about that the, the wall of hostility that exists between Jew and Gentile has been brought down, has been destroyed in Christ. And so if that wall has been destroyed, it would be the work of the enemy to rebuild that wall within the church. To rebuild what God has torn down through the gospel. And so the gospel of Jesus Christ and, and showing partiality, these things do not mix. You can't hold on to both of those. If you're going to hold on to the gospel, it's going to require you to let go of showing partiality. And if you will not let go of your partiality... You will have to let go of the gospel. Here's the great truth of the gospel, that God is not partial. That God shows no partiality. That, that God accepts all of us, all who turn to him in faith. We don't come to God on the basis of our credit card account, our bank account, or our FICO score, or what kind of car we drive. We don't come to Christ based on our family status, or our education, or, or, our, or our achievements. God shows no partiality. And so this, this showing of partiality in his church is a poor reflection of the God that we serve and the gospel that we preach. God accepts all who turn to him in faith. No matter what status we have in the world, when we stand at the foot of the cross, we are all the same. This is why when we serve communion, we don't have, you know, the really fancy communion for the wealthy givers. You know, the big tithers have the, the you know, the, the, the gold circle for, for them. And they get to go, you know, eat a loaf of bread and, you know, drink really fancy, expensive wine or something. No, we all drink the same cup. We all eat the same bread because we've all been saved by the same Savior. We've all been washed in the same blood. We've all been filled with the same spirit. We all need the same cure. And so before God, we stand clothed in ourselves and in our own righteousness. All of us come to God clothed in our own filthy rags. God is not impressed with our standing in society. In fact, we must let go of that as our identity if we will even come to Christ at the cross. We come empty-handed. We come needing his righteousness to clothe us. So number one, showing partiality in the gospel, they don't even mix. They're, they're totally incompatible. We cannot hold the faith in our Lord Jesus Christ and show partiality at the same time. Number two, he goes on to say, 
that God's kingdom is upside down from the kingdom of the world. We see this here in verse 5. He says, listen, my brothers, has not God chosen those who are poor in the world to be rich in the faith and heirs of the kingdom, which he has promised to those who love him? God's kingdom doesn't work like the kingdom of the world. God calls the weak. God calls the broken. God calls the poor. God calls the needy. God calls the broken. These are the ones that God chooses. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, we won't take time to turn there tonight. I encourage you to, to read it on your own. It says that God chooses those kinds of people to shame the world, to, to make the world system foolish, to show that it is folly, to, to, to shame the wise of the world, and to show that God's foolishness is wiser than the wisdom of of men, that God puts his glory on display by working through broken vessels. It's not the elite that God calls, it's the poor, it's the broken. And God puts his power on display in vessels that the world would despise. That's why we're here tonight. <laughs> Look around this room. Look at us. We are the biggest ragtag bunch of people. Are we not? And Paul, all, all, that, all that James is saying is recognize that God's kingdom doesn't work like the kingdom of the world. Don't, don't, don't start acting like the world when you come into the church. God's kingdom is upside down. And even though that this is true and that this is the reality and we know that God chooses what the world rejects, Christ being the cornerstone of that process, don't we sometimes still think and act like the world? If we didn't, we wouldn't need this scripture instructing us to do otherwise. Oftentimes our actions don't line up with what we confess and what we say we believe. Here's one way that, that we can see the, the sin of partiality in our hearts trying to rear its ugly head. When we hear about somebody famous, somebody powerful, somebody wealthy, some music star, some movie star, when we hear that they're a Christian, don't we get excited about that? Don't we say, oh, they're a Christian too? D doesn't that stroke something in us? W wasn't it just a few years ago where people were saying that Kanye West was going to be the next Billy Graham? You remember that? I know that was like 18 months ago and so nobody can remember back that far. People, that's not even a joke. People were literally saying that. Well, that didn't quite work out. We're so quick to jump on these trains of these celebrities that are Christian. We get so excited about it. Wow, God's really going to do something now because this person was saved. And there's this tendency, what it is, is in our hearts, we're seeking legitimacy. We're seeking legitimacy for what we believe from powerful people. We want ourselves to be legitimized by the wealthy, by the famous, by the celebrities. And so when so-and-so believes what we believe, don't we feel legitimized? Don't we feel authenticated? I mean, isn't that why we buy Air Jordan shoes? Because, you know, Michael Jordan wears them. We, we want to be associated with people who are someone and something. But here's the truth of the Christian faith. Christ does not need anyone to legitimize him. Christ legitimizes himself. The empty tomb is, what's, is, is what makes Christ legitimate. 
He does not need anyone powerful. He does not need anyone famous to accomplish his work for the gospel to go out. Think about how Christianity started. 120 nobodies that turned the world upside down. Nobody famous, nobody powerful. We only know of one that was halfway educated. These peasants, these fishermen turned the world upside down for Christ. And we get so excited about, you know, I'm not even going to say their names. Christ doesn't need that at all. He legitimizes himself. Now, I, I pray that, you know, that all come to repentance. And, I, I mean, I celebrate when people turn to Christ, whether they're rich or they're poor, whether they're famous or not, whether they're a celebrity or not. I celebrate anybody coming to Christ. But I don't think that, oh, now, oh, now it's going to happen. Oh, now, watch out, devil. You know, so-and-so is a Christian now. No, isn't that showing, isn't that the sin of partiality? To think that, that, that God needs somebody else's platform? Hello? The sky is his platform. The world is his platform. The universe is his stage. God doesn't need anybody to accomplish what he wants to accomplish. So we don't need to look to see powerful people who would believe what we would believe. Oftentimes they themselves having such a platform uh, end up, not, you know, people end up putting their faith in these people who are themselves imperfect and fallen vessels. And then they're disappointed and then they're embarrassed and then they're ashamed because shocker people still sin we need to stop putting people on a pedestal that's what this passage is about whether it's in our gathering or or or, or in the kingdom of god the kingdom of god is upside down from the kingdom of the world christ legitimizes himself there is no one higher than him that can lend to Christ their authority or their validity or their platform. Christ is the ultimate. He is above all things. You cannot appeal to anything or anyone beyond him because there is nothing or no one above him. Jesus is the name above all names. And this is why when God made a covenant with Abraham... He swore by himself. He swore by his name. Because there's nothing above him by which he could swear. So he swore by himself to accomplish his promise. So part of overcoming this sin of partiality is getting beyond thinking. Well, if we could just get so-and-so saved, we could really do some things for the kingdom of God. We already have Jesus. Okay? Okay? He tips the scale, okay? It's already done. The, the scale is already tipped. You cannot get more valid or authentic or real or legitimate or powerful than Jesus. And so there's this desire to be legitimized by, in the eyes of the world. We have, to, we have to do away with that. Another way this manifests is in the sin of partiality is the desire for man's approval, to have man's approval. And of course, we're social beings, we're communal beings, we're community-based people. We tend naturally to care a whole lot about what other people think about us, especially powerful people. That's how we think, that's how we live, that's the natural way. But as Christians, we're called not to live with this idea of, of seeking man's approval, but this idea of seeking God's approval. And the Apostle Paul says that these two things are at odds with one another. In Galatians chapter 1, he says, I can either seek for God's approval or man's approval. 
And if I'm seeking after the approval of men, I will not be a servant of Christ. And so number one, the sin of partiality is incompatible with the gospel. Number two, God's kingdom is upside down from the world. God chooses what we would not choose. God does what we would not do. His ways are not our ways. His thoughts are not our thoughts. And then finally, number three, partiality is a sin because it violates the law of God. Partiality is a sin because it violates the law of God. We see this here in verse 8. He says, if you really fulfill the royal law according to the scripture, you shall love your neighbor as yourself, you are doing well. But if you show partiality or you are committing sin and convicted by the law as transgressors. Verse 10, he goes on to say that whoever keeps the whole law but fails in one point has become accountable for all of it. Has become countable for all of it. Here, uh, James lists what Jesus calls the second greatest commandment. Of course, we know the first greatest commandment is to love the Lord God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. That's the, the first and greatest commandment. But the second commandment, Jesus says, is like unto it. Quoting from the book of Deuteronomy, Jesus says that the second greatest commandment is to love your neighbor as yourself. And when we show partiality, when we treat others based upon their, their status in the eyes of the world, we are not loving our neighbor as ourself. We are breaking this commandment. We are breaking God's law. To love our neighbor as ourself means what's often called the golden rule, to treat others the way you want to be treated. How do you want to be treated? How do you want to be welcomed when you come to worship? How do you want to be greeted when you come to church? That's the way we're to treat others. That's the way we're to welcome others. That's the way we're to greet and receive others. To love our neighbor as ourself means that we love people without any regard to their social status, to their wealth, to, to whatever identity or, or political affiliation that they might ascribe to in the world, we are called to love as we want to be loved. And that should manifest, James is saying, when we gather together to worship. That we would make people, all people who come in here, regardless of culture, regardless of status, regardless of income level, regardless of, of race, regardless of all of these things, that all people would feel embraced and loved and welcomed in our gatherings. There's, there's, there's a point here that I want to bring clarity to and I think, I think right now is a really good time to do it as we're talking on this subject. We have, at this church, made no um, concessions on compromising with sin. We have been very clear at this church that even the sin that's oftentimes paraded in our streets a sin that has a whole month dedicated to celebrating it in June. We've been very clear at our church that, that we do not affirm that, we do not um, embrace people in that, that that is a sin that the Bible teaches that needs to be repented of. And while we hold to that because we love those who are caught in that sin, while we hold to that truth, at the same time we are called to love everyone who walks through our doors. To not make any judgments, to, to, to not say, ooh, they look a little bit, 
Uh, I, I'm going to, you know, uh, wait and see. No, the Bible says that we should embrace people with love. To love our neighbors as ourselves. So we do not compromise. We preach the gospel and we preach truth and we preach repentance of sin. But we also open up our arms and our hearts to love people. That in our gatherings, our gatherings can be a place. Can they be a place? Can our gatherings be a place where someone who has been caught in that lifestyle, if they come in, is there a place for them here to meet Jesus? When they come in, will they feel the love of Christ? Or will they feel condemnation? The Bible says that it is the goodness of God that leads us to repentance. I will preach the truth. You, you, you don't have to worry about that. I think you know that by now. We're, we're going to preach an uncompromising gospel that calls people to repentance of all sin. And I'm calling you to repentance tonight of the sin of partiality. So you, you know that, that I'm not going to compromise on, on the message on the gospel, that that's not going to happen. But when they come in, will they feel the love of Christ? The goodness of God that leads to repentance. Will they feel that they are loved as we love ourselves? Will they, will they feel an embrace? Will they feel the hands of Christ extended to them? I pray that they do. I pray that they would. You know, there's going to be, I predict, this is my prediction. I could be wrong. I'm not a prophet, I'm not claiming to have any sort of insight or anything like that. But I predict that in a few years, five or six years, three or four years, there is going to be a tidal wave of people who wake up one day and realize that they have been lied to. They are going to realize that they've sterilized themselves, they've taken, taken hormones to transform their bodies, and that they have forever altered themselves. And they're going to wake up and say, what have I done? And will there be a place for them when they come looking for answers? When, 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 when this generation of people who are being mutilated by demonic inspired quote unquote doctors when they wake up and realize they were lied to by the devil and begin to detransition and then they are rejected by the world because they will only be accepted if they go that direction. If, if they wake up and say, hey, I, I, I think I'm going back to this other direction. They are absolutely rejected and cut off from the world that affirmed them. Will they find a place in the church? Will they find a body of people who will love them and embrace them as a sinner that needs a savior? When they wake up and begin to look for answers, will there be a place in the church for them? And if we don't ourselves realize that if it weren't for the grace of God, we would go likewise. If it weren't for the grace of God, we would all be hopeless. Will we as a church be willing to extend love and grace to those who begin to look for the truth and look for Jesus without prejudging them, without looking at them and saying, oh, I don't want them in our church. It makes me uncomfortable. It's bizarre. It's confusing. Again, hear me clearly. I'm not saying affirming anybody in their sin. You know me. You know me, right? You've, you've, I've emptied this church out by preaching the truth, okay? 
I'm not capitulating. I'm not, the pendulum is not swinging. All I'm saying is, while we hold to the truth of the gospel, we're also called to love people. And Jesus calls us to do both. And partiality, prejudging people, it is a sin because it violates the law of God that says to love your neighbor as yourself, to treat people the way you want to be treated. And so, in conclusion tonight, the bottom line is this. Everybody needs Jesus. Everybody needs Jesus. You need Jesus. I need Jesus. The person out on the street needs Jesus. The CEO down here at Walmart needs Jesus. Like, everybody needs Jesus. And it's the same gospel that saves all of us. And what partiality does, and I think that James recognizes here, partiality creates obstacles. It stands in the way. It blocks people off. It keeps people at an arm's length who need Jesus. And what James is calling us here to do is to remove any obstacles that would be present in our gatherings or in our hearts that would stand in the way that would prevent someone from coming to Jesus. And I can tell you that walking into a place where you feel like you're being judged, walk into a place where you, you, can, you can feel that, that there's this tension there where I don't know if I'm going to be accepted, I don't know if I'm going to be loved, but if, if they walk in here and they feel the love of Christ and then the, the Holy Spirit would touch their hearts through the preaching of the word. This is why the Apostle Paul can say to the letter, to, to the, to, when he writes to the Corinthians, he lists this whole list of sins. He says, none of these will inherit the kingdom of God. And then he says, but such were some of you. But you were washed, you were cleansed, and you were sanctified. Let's not forget that we too have been washed, cleansed, and sanctified. Let's not forget that we too once walked through those doors the first time. And we didn't know if we would be loved. We didn't know what was going to lie ahead. And I pray that just as you have been embraced and that as we have been loved, that we would also continue to open our arms to those who need the loving touch of the Savior. Amen.